Hello, so today I'm going over the chapter four review, I'm working it out step by step, um, so that you're prepared for your chapter four test. Um, so in this first problem, um, we have rational exponents, and one thing you wanna look at and see is that all of the exponents are the same. They all have an exponent of two thirds, which means that we can use the rule um, that we can basically take rewrite this as 2 over 3 times 18 to the 2 thirds power. Um, so we're that's one of our exponential rules. One of your exponential rules is that when you have an exponent on the outside it can be distributed to all the factors on the inside and this is a time sign. Um, so you can also work backwards if all of them have the same exponent you can take it back out and then simplify the fraction that's underneath. So the 2 and the 18 I can divide both by 2 which will give me 1 over 3 times 9 and then um, so I divided the 2 and the 18 by 2 then I can multiply the 3 and the 9 together which will give me 1 over 27 but all of this is still being taken to the 2 thirds power. Now we can rewrite our, our exponent as a radical the 3 is our root, and the 2 is our power. So the cubed root of 1 over 27 is 1 third. So then you can take, so the cubed root of 127 is 1 third, and then you can square that. 1 squared is 1, 3 squared is 9, and that is your answer. And because it was an odd root, there would um, we would not have a plus or minus to worry about. Um, Actually, with this one, we are just simplifying. So when you're simplifying, you're not going to have a plus minus, even if it is even root. All right, number two. Number two, you have, um, it's in radical form. We're trying to figure out, um, we're going to simplify the fourth root of 125, x to the seventh. So what we want to do is we want to factor the 125 and the x to the seventh into things that are perfect fourth powers. So one way of doing this, I like to do my upside down division. Um, so divide by two and I get 64. Divide by two again, I get 32. Keep dividing by two until you can't divide by two anymore, which will give me 16. And then divide by two. So I've got a whole lot of twos here, um, which will give me eight because I think 128 is a power of two. Um, now I could continue, but since I've already got four twos there, basically this is telling me that 128 is two to the fourth power times eight. And eight is not a perfect fourth power, nor will there be any factors of eight that are perfect fourth powers because eight is two to the third power. If I was to re keep con uh, continue dividing by two, I would get four and then divide by two again, which gives me two. So 28 is really two to the seventh power. But in order for something to be a perfect fourth power, there has to be something to the, uh, you have to have two, four of them. So I'm going to rewrite this and factor that 128 into two to the fourth power and fourth root of two to the third power, which we can just leave as eight. The other um, the part of this is the variable. So the variable I can separate into the fourth root of x to the fourth times the fourth root of x to the third. Probably should have started over here a little bit more. Um, so then the fourth root of two to the fourth will reduce and I get two. So that's a perfect fourth power which means it gets to go outside. Well, this one's not a perfect fourth power, so it's gonna have to stay under the radical in our answer. The x to the fourth is a perfect fourth power, so it can go outside because it's perfect, but the x to the third is not, so it's gonna have to stay under the radical also. So when we put the things back that are under that have to stay under the radical, you've got an eight and you've got an x to the third. And make sure that the fourth root is in that radical and it does not look like it's part of that x to the fourth power. So that would be your simplified version. Another way um, of thinking about it, if you know that um, 16 is a perfect fourth power, 
um, you know that 2 to the fourth power is 16. You could have also just taken that 128 and factored it into 16, fourth root of 16 times the fourth root of 8. And then again, that um, x to the seventh would have been fourth root of x to the fourth times the fourth root of x to the third. And then the fourth root of 16 would give you 2. The fourth root of 8 could not be simplified. The fourth root of x to the fourth is x. And then you've got this one left over. So again, those two together would give you 8x to the third underneath. So if you don't know what your perfect fourth powers are, um, finding all the factors, doing a prime factorization would help. Um, but if you do know your perfect fourth powers, 16 being the smallest one that will help us, um, and try dividing 128 by 16, then you can factor the 128 into 16 and 8 and go on from there. All right, over explain that one. Moving on, number three. So in number three, we're kind of doing the same thing. Um, what's nice, though, about 243, 243 is a perfect fifth power. Um, 243 is equal to 3 to the fifth power. So that one is already a perfect, perfect fifth power. Your t to the 17th, we could factor that into um, t to the 15th times the fifth root of t squared. So t to the 15th and t squared multiplied together would give us the t to the 17th that we started with. But I wanted to, um, with exponents, they have to add up to that number there, the exponent there. Um, and 15 is smaller than 17, but it's also a multiple of 5. So um, that's why separating it into 15 and 2 works well, because two, two, t to the 15th power is a perfect fifth power. Um, basically, it's t to the third to the fifth power, technically. So if you have the fifth power and the fifth root to cancel, then you get t to the third. A shortcut would just be to take the power divided by the root. So 15 divided by 5 gives us t to the third, and that would go on the outside. Also, this fifth power and fifth root cancel, so we have a 3 on the outside. Well, what else? Um, p to the 20th, because 20 is a multiple of 5, it's going to be a fifth, uh, perfect fifth power also. So um, we can just divide the 20 by the 5, and we would get p to the 4th. So, uh, or again, we can rewrite it as p to the 4th to the 5th power, so that the 5 times 4 equals 20. Um, so it does equal what we started with, but then the fifth root and the fifth power cancel out, giving us p to the fourth. So the only thing that's not been reduced is the fifth root of t squared. Since that is not a perfect fifth power, it has to stay underneath. And we've simplified that one. Okay, the next one, number four, we have um, 8 over the fourth root of x to the third. So one of the rules about simplifying is you cannot have a radical in the denominator. So what we're trying to do, I'll rewrite this over here so I have a little bit more room. We need to multiply by a fraction so that we end up getting a fourth root of x to the fourth in the denominator. So we have to multiply by something that will give us the perfect fourth power so that that will cancel with the fourth root. So the only thing we can do here, since we've already got an x to the third, and you can only multiply fourth roots by fourth roots, you need to have a four, an x to the first power. So if I multiply the fourth root of x to the third by the fourth root of x to the first, I get fourth root of x to the fourth. But you have to multiply whatever, um, whatever you multiply in the bottom, you have to multiply in the top. So then um, the 8 and the 4th root of x, this is a whole number, this is a radical, so you cannot multiply them together other than just rewriting them and putting them next to each other. And then the 4th root of x to the 4th reduces, um, and now we have x in our denominator. And your numerator is 8 fourth root of x. So now we have rationalized the denominator. Number five is similar in that um, we're going to have to rationalize the denominator, but um, 
it's a number instead of a variable. So in the numerator, I've got the cubed root of 4. In the denominator, I've got the cubed root of 5. So I need to figure out what can I multiply it by so that I end up getting a cubed root of 5 to the third so that the root and the power cancel out and I can get rid of the radical in the denominator. Again, you can only multiply cubed roots by cubed roots. Well, this 5 is to the first power, so if we multiply it by a 5 squared, that will give us a 5 to the third. But whatever you multiply the denominator by, you have to multiply the numerator by also. And then um, the 4 and the 5 squared, If we, we since they're both cubed roots, we can multiply what's underneath together. So 5 squared is 25 times 4 would be a 100. And 100 does not have any uh, perfect cubes that are factors of 100. And then the third root and the third power cancel out. And our simplified radical would be the cubed root of 100 over 5. And there we have it. Number six is one where we have a um, binomial in the denominator with a radical. So what we need to do here is multiply by its conjugate. So this is a little bit different than the last two. Yes, we're rationalizing the denominator, but because it's a binomial, we have to multiply it by its conjugate. So the conjugate is a, another binomial, same numbers here and here, but instead of a negative, we're going to have a positive. And again, whatever you multiply the denominator by, you have to multiply the numerator by also. So um, this um, numerator, so when I multiply the numerator together, the three times the fifteen or the three times the five gives me fifteen, the three times the square root of seven is three square root of seven. However, your denominator, you're gonna have to foil it out. And what's nice is when we do foil it out, we'll be able to get rid of the denominators that way. So let me show you. So the five times the five will give us twenty-five. The 5 times the square root of 7 is a positive 5 square root of 7. Watch your signs. The negative square root of 7 times 5 is going to be negative 5 square root of 7. And the negative square root of 7 times a positive square root of 7 is a negative square root of 49, which will reduce to just 7. But there is a minus sign in front of it. And then this positive square, 5 square root of 7 and negative 5 square root of 7 cancel out. This 25 now gets subtracted with the 7 and your denominator then is going to be um, 18. So our simplified answer, the numerator will be 15 plus 3 square root of 7 over 18. And there we have it. Um, the next one is both basically the exact same type of problem, but instead of a plus sign or a minus sign in the middle, we have a plus sign. So. Let me start over here on the left-hand side using all the space. So square root of 6 plus 9. So when I multiply by its conjugate, it's going to be square root of 6 minus 9. So again, it's a binomial, but the signs are different so that the middle terms, whoops, helps if you can see it, the middle terms are going to cancel out when I FOIL that out. But the numerator, just distribute and I get 8 square root of 6 minus 72 at the top. When I FOIL this one out, the square root of 6 times square root of 6 is going to be the square root of 36, which is going to simplify to 6. The square root of 6 times the negative 9, negative 9 square root of 6. 9 times square root of 6 is positive 9 square root of 6. Negative, positive 9 times negative 9 will be negative 81. So again, those middle terms cancel out, but we have a 6 minus an 81 which is going to give us a negative um, 75. Yeah. All right, so then um, at the end here, you probably should not leave this negative under, on the bottom. If you did have this as an answer, I'd probably accept it. However, um, you do want to double check if all of your, um, see if there's a number that you could factor out of both of these terms that would reduce with this one down here. It does not, but you could simplify the negative and um, distribute the negative to both of those. Um, which would give you a negative 8 square root of 6 plus 72 over a positive 75. So either one of these I would accept as a final answer. All right, the next one, um, we now are adding radicals together. 
Well, in order to add a radical together, you have to have like radicals, kind of like if you have like terms. So if you have 7x plus 5x, you can add the coefficients to get 12x. Well, here we've got a square root of 7. This one cannot be simplified. This one is not a square root of 7. However, if it was a square root of 7, a uh, fourth root of 7, I'm sorry, fourth root of 7, then we could add those together. Well, I'm guessing that 567 has a factor of 7 in it. So if I divide the 567 by 7, I get 81, which is a perfect fourth power. So I'm going to factor this and simplify this radical into fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of 7. And then that fourth root of 81, since 81 is a perfect fourth power, it's 3 to the fourth power, becomes 3. And then when I multiply it by that 7, I get 21, and then this fourth root of 7 comes down. Then the second term I can bring down plus 5 fourth root of 7. So now that those are the same, we can basically factor out the fourth root of 7, and then you would just add the 21 plus 5 together, and so it's kind of like you're factoring it out, but put it at the end, and then add your coefficients, and you get 26 fourth root of 7. And there you go. Number 9. Again, we have, um, we're adding or subtracting radicals, but this time um, we have variables underneath. So once again, look at um, what you have here and see if there's anything that you could do to simplify either one of these to make them uh, the same radical. So um, actually, we can simplify both of these. Um, the cubed root of 64, that 64 is 4 to the third power. So I could rewrite the 64 as 4 to the third power. My r to the seventh, I can take the cubed root of r to the sixth times the cubed root of r to the first. So I'm just simply showing you how I can simplify this one term. So the cubed root of uh, 4 to the third would be 4. And then the 6 divided by 3, it would give me 2, or r squared. But this one is not a perfect cube, so it has to stay underneath. Now if you look at the second term, you've already got a 7 on the outside, and you have r. But this r to the fourth, since it, the 4 is bigger than the 3, I can factor that into cubed root of r to the third times the cubed root of r. And then that cubed root of r to the third will give me another r to multiply with the 7r that I've already got. And then I've got this cubed root of r left over here. So the, neg the 7r times that r is going to give me negative 7r squared and then cubed root of r. So let's make this look a little neater. 4r squared cubed root of r is what we got here, minus 7r squared cubed root of r there. So since these are like terms and the radicals are like terms, we can factor out the r to the third, but again, put it at the end. And then the, set, the 4r squared minus the 7r squared um, together will give us a negative 3r squared cubed root of r. And that one's worked out and simplified. Okay, um, the next two are solving equations. So number 10, we are, um, we've got a cubed uh, x to the third power. Um, what you want to do first is you want to get that, um, whatever's being taken to the power, you want to get it by itself. So this 13's got to be moved and we've got to get rid of that fraction in front. So I'm going to subtract the 13, and then I'm going to get two, my new equation will be 2 fifths x to the third equals negative uh, 6. Then um, I like to, um, to get rid of the fraction, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by the reciprocal of our fraction, 5 halves. So multiply both sides by 5 halves. So then the 5's reduce, the 2's reduce. So that gets rid of my coefficient there. You could divide by, by 2 fifths, but multiplying by the reciprocal gives you a nice 1 there. And I think that's a little bit easier when you have a fraction. Um, so we get x to the third on the left. And then here you've got your whole number. 
negative 6 times 5 would be negative 30, divided by 2 would be negative 15. So um, now that I've got the x to the third by itself, I have to um, take the cubed root of both sides of the equation. Now some of you are thinking it's negative. Can we take the cubed root of a negative? Yes. If it was an even root, then a square root or a fourth root, then this would give us an imaginary number. But since it's a cubed root, you can take the cubed root of even or of odd num um, negative numbers. So the cubed root cancels out the cube there, giving us x equals, and then this you'd want to plug in the calculator. So let me show you how you can do that. Um, start with the 3, and then hit your second caret to get that x root up there, telling the calculator you're taking the third root of, and then negative 15 equals, and then we're going to round, I think it says, to the nearest hundredth if necessary. So this is one where you would round to the nearest one hundredth, but only if the directions tell you to. If it just says simplify, then you have to leave it as a just cubed root of negative 15. Um, you could factor out the negative, but it would be negative cubed root of 15. Um, all right, so the 6 is in the hundredth place. Since there's a 6 after it, we round up to 7. So that would be our answer, rounded to the nearest hundredth. The other thing that you could have done, um, another option, you could have rewritten this as a radical exponent, or rational exponent, and the cube root of 3 is the same as something to the one-third power. So if you're more comfortable putting in something to the one-third power, um, you would, in your parentheses, negative 15, and then caret 1 abc3. And that, again, would give you the same value that we had. All right, so either way you plug it in, you'll get the same thing. But you have to know how to plug it in the calculator. That's important. All right, the next problem, we have um, this x plus 2 that's being taken to the 6th power. So if we're solving for x and it's part of that quantity that's taken to the 6th power, we again need to get rid of that 5 and we need to get rid of that 3 that's in front and get the uh, parentheses, the x plus 2 to the 6th power by itself. So add your 5 to both sides to cancel that out. So now our new equation, 3 parentheses x plus 2 to the 6th power equals 3. And then we would divide by um, the negative 3, or not the negative 3, divide by 3 to reduce that 3 that's in front. So our new equation now is x plus 2 to the 6th power equals 1. So now that we have the whatever's being taken to the power by itself, we're going to get rid of that 6th power by taking the 6th root of both sides. And um, if you don't know this off the top of your head, any root of 1, um, whether it's a 3rd root, a 4th root, a 5th root, a 6th root, um, whenever you take 1 to any root, it's always going to equal 1. But because it's an even root, this is the, the key to this problem, to getting this one right, because it's an even root, it's not just positive 1, it's positive or negative 1. And that, again, is because it was an even root. Even roots have two roots. Um, so then we have x plus 2 equals positive or negative 1. So now we have basically um, what you might want to do is write this as two equations. x plus 2 equals positive 1 and or or x plus 2 equals negative 1. So the x plus 2 part is staying the same, but one of them is going to equal positive 1, one of them is going to equal negative 1. So then when you solve these two little equations, you get x equals negative 1. I've got to leave room for my negative there. And subtract 2 here. And you get x equals negative 3. So there are two solutions. Um, so if you have only one of them, you're only going to get half credit. All right, moving on to the next page. Um, number 12. So we've got a radical equation here. Instead of having something to a power, we have something to a root. So this is a square root. When there's no root written, it, the unwritten root is 2. Um, so to get rid of that root, we're going to have to square both sides of the equation. So 
I'm going to bring that down, show you what that looks like. So when we square both sides of the equation, the square root and the square cancel each other out, and you get 7x plus 15. But on the right side of the equation, you're squaring a binomial. You don't have a square root. So when you square a binomial, some people might need to rewrite that x plus 1 squared as x plus 1 times x plus 1. Do not make the mistake of just squaring each term. Because of that plus sign, that is incorrect. So you have to either rewrite it and FOIL it out. So x times x would be x squared. Then I would have x times 1, which is 1x. On the inside, I have another 1x. So the outside 1x on the inside 1x will give us a positive 2x. 1 times 1 would be a positive 1. And then that's going to equal my 7x plus 15. Now, I have get, it, since it's a quadratic equation, I have to um, move these terms to the other side. So subtract 7x and subtract 15. So that I now get 0 equals x squared minus 5x minus 14. So now that it's set equal to 0, we ask ourselves, well, can we factor it? Are there two numbers that multiply together to equal 14 that have a difference of 5? Yes, 7 and 2. So this will factor into x minus 7 and x plus 2. So then we get solutions of x equals 7 and x equals negative 2. Now, with radical equations, you do need to check your solutions. So you're checking for extraneous roots. But when you check them, that put them back into the original equation. So I'm just going to kind of verbally and mentally check it. So if I put 7 in the equation here for x, 7 times 7 would be 49, plus the 15 would be uh, 64. And if I put 7 in here for x, plus 1 would be 8. So is the square root of 64 equal to 8? Yes, so the x plus or the x equals seven works. But if I put negative one or negative two in for x, two times negative two is negative fourteen, plus fifteen is one, and the square root of four, um, four uh, the square root of one is one. If I put negative two in here for x, x negative two plus one equals a negative one. So in radical equations, the even root cannot equal a negative number. So the negative 2 is extraneous, which means 7 is our only solution. So be careful to make sure that you check your solutions. Okay, number 13. So in number 13, we have this um, rational exponent, which makes the problem look a little bit harder than it actually is. So this is what you do to get rid of a rational exponent. You're going to take it to a power. Oops. I wasn't supposed to put that there yet. Okay, so we've got x minus 5 to the 5 thirds power. Well, when you have a power outside of a power, those powers get multiplied. And we would like for the exponent to be 1. So what would we have to multiply 5 thirds by that would equal 1? It's reciprocal, 3 fifths. So we're going to take both sides of the equation to the 3 fifths power. So when we take the left side of the equation here to the 3 fifths power, the 5 thirds and the 3 fifths becomes 1. So we basically have x minus 5 to the first power, which is just x minus 5. On the right side, we have 243 to the third 3 fifths power, which you could plug that into the calculator, or you can simplify it if you know. Um, the fifth root of 243 the fifth root of 243 is 3, and then to the third power is going to be 27. But if you want to just plug it into the calculator, save a little bit of time, 243 to the power of, make sure you use your ABC button, um, 3 fifths, and then hit your equals, and that'll give you 27 that way. And with this one, though, it's an odd root. The last one we had, um, and oh, well, that's a radical. Okay, so... I was thinking the plus minus, but because it's a radical equation, it's going to be different. All right, so um, I'm going to finish up this problem here. Um, so that made the problem a lot easier when I just took it to the power of its reciprocal. So now add 5, and I get x equals 32. And that's my answer.
Okay, so now we're going to continue on to number 14. And in number 14, we have a radical equation. There's only one radical sign. So what we need to do is get rid of the radical in our first step by squaring both sides of the equation. So when you square the left side, you have a binomial. A binomial squared should give you a trinomial. So some people need to rewrite that as x minus 3 times another x minus 3, then do that. And then when you FOIL it out, you get x squared minus 6x plus 9. But on the right-hand side, the square, since you have a square root on the right side, the square cancels out the square root. So now we have a quadratic equation um, that has an x squared term and an x term. So we're going to move um, the 10, we're going to subtract the 10x to both sides and add 54 to both sides so that we get 0 on one side and everything else on the other. So now we've got x squared plus 16x plus 63 which can then factor into um, x minus 7 and x minus 9. So our two solutions will be 7 and 9. However, we want to make sure that neither one of these is extraneous. So with a square root, a radical equation, as long as there's a, a, a no sign in front of here, it's a positive square root. So the, the, oh, um, you cannot, it cannot equal a negative number. So your square root equation cannot equal a negative number. So if I were to put 7 in for x, 7 minus 3 would be 4. So that would work. Okay, let's check it on this side. 7 times 10 is 70. 70 minus 54 is um, 16, and the square root of 16 does equal 4. So 7 does work, but you have to check it into your original equation. Then we'll try 9. Well, if I put 9 in for x, substitute 9 for x, 9 minus 3 is 6. Okay, so that is okay. We don't get a negative number. If we put 9 in here, 9, minus, or 9 times 10 is 90. 90 minus 54 is 36 which the square root of 36 is 6. So this is one of those rare um, equations where both solutions work. Um, but in the one before here, we had one that had an extraneous root. So you do need to check both solutions. And sometimes you have one extraneous root and one is a solution. Sometimes they'll both be solutions. But there will also be some situations where both of them are extraneous. So you do need to check your solutions in your original equation whenever you have an even root. If it's an odd root, then you don't have to worry about it. Just with the even roots, like the square root and the Mm, just the square root, I guess. All right, so the next one has also um, got square roots, but we have two of them. When you have two square roots, you want to make sure you have one radical on one side, one radical on the other side of the equation. So I'm going to move the, um, the one that's negative on the other side by adding it. So you're just going to add that whole term. And the one here and this radical are not like terms, so you can't really put them together, but um, I can rewrite this now as 3 minus, the square root of 3 minus x equals 1 plus the square root of x plus 2. And then now we can um, square both sides, which will only get rid of one of these radicals, unfortunately. We're going to have to, um, this one's a little bit longer of a problem, so um, just be patient and work one step at a time and get through it. Um, so when you square root, um, the square and the square root cancel each other out here, which gives you just the 3 minus x. So that radical goes away. However, on the right side, um, you have this 1 plus the square root. So this is kind of like a binomial squared, which means we have to rewrite it and FOIL it. or distribute. So the 1 times the 1 is 1. The 1 times the square root of x plus 2 is just going to be a positive 1 square root of x plus 2. At least we don't have any signs negatives to worry about. Um, on the inside you're going to get another positive 1 square root of x plus 2. And then when you multiply the square root of 2, or the square root of x plus 2 times another square root of x plus 2, you're going to basically get the square root of x plus 2 squared. So um, 
this radical then will go away. Um, and then we're going to combine like terms. So we've got this one here. Um, the one square root of x plus 2 plus the other square root of x plus 2 is going to give us two square root of x plus 2s. And then over here, when the radical and the square cancel each other out, you get x plus 2. Um, so now you can have a couple like terms here. The 2 and the 1 you can add together to get 3. Um, I'm going to also just put the, the x in front so that the radical is the end. All right, so that's really all we can do. So on this right side, we took the one plus square root of two, or the one plus square root of x plus two squared. So we multiplied it by itself, foiled it out, um, simplified what we could, and this is where we're at. So on the left side, we're going to bring that down. So now that we're down to only one radical, we want to get this square root of x plus two by itself. So we're going to get these things t terms on the other side. Um, so I'll show you what that's going to look like. So we're going to subtract 3 and subtract x. So when you subtract 3, that cancels. And when you subtract x, that cancels. What's nice is on the other side, the 3 minus 3 cancels also. But the x's do not. You get negative 2x equals the plus sign you don't need to bring down. But you do need the 2 square root of x plus 2. And then we would have to um, get rid of this 2 also that's in front by dividing by 2. So that reduces now. And the negative 2x divided by 2 is negative 1x. So a lot of um, that, that worked out to be nice, um, a nice small thing right now. So uh, equation. So now we need to still get rid of this radical. But now that it's by itself, when we square both sides, we will finally be able to get rid of all the radicals in the equation. So the square and square root cancel. The negative 1x when you square it will be a positive 1x squared. And now again, we have a quadratic equation. We have to um, move everything to one side and set it equal to 0. But I want my x squared term to remain positive. So I'm going to leave this one here. This x, when I move it over, will become negative x. That 2, when you move it over, becomes negative 2 equals 0. And then I'm going to solve this by factoring. This factors into x minus 2 and x plus 1. So my possible solutions are 2 and negative 1. But then again, you have to check them back in the original equation to see if you have if either one of them are extraneous roots. So we've got 2 and negative 1. All right, so where is the beginning? Yeah, way back up here. All right, so back in your original equation, if I check it, you know, let's check it over here. Got a little bit of room there. Um, so my original equation was the square root of 3 minus x minus the square root of x plus 2 equals 1. So if I substitute 2 into this equation, the square root of 3 minus 2 minus the square root of 2 plus 2, does that equal 1? Well, 3 minus 2 is 1. The square root of 1 is 1. 2 plus 2 is 4. And the square root of 4 is 2. 1 minus 2 does not equal 1. So that was 2 that we substituted. So that is an extraneous root. That one did not work. So now we're going to try plugging 1 in for x. So if I put 1 in for x, 3 minus 1 minus um, negative 1 plus 2 equals 1. So 3 minus 1, oh, it's a negative 1. So if I take 3 minus a negative 1, that's going to end up being a positive 1. So 3 minus a negative would be positive 4. The square root of that, which is 2, and then minus negative 1 plus 2 is 1. The square root of 1 is 1. And 2 minus 1 does equal 1. So in this problem, the negative answer ended up being the one that was a solution. And the positive answer ended up one that was not. So once again, proves that you have to try both of your um, solutions in the original equation. All right. The next one, though, is an easier one. Um, what we like about it, even though we do have two radicals, there's nothing being added or subtracted to the two radicals. So um, when we take both sides of the equation to the third power, that is going to eliminate that cubed root.
So the, um, this is a cubed root. All right, so the cubed root and the third power basically cancel each other out and you get four fifths x minus nine equals, again, the cubed root and the third power cancel each other out, giving you x minus six. So we have a nice linear equation. Um, you could just subtract the x or add or subtract the four fifths to both sides and work with the, the numbers the way they are. Or if you wanted, you can get rid of the denominator by multiplying both sides of your equation by five, which I typically like to do. I don't like to work with fractions a whole lot. So the five times the four fifths would be four x. The five times the negative nine would be negative 45. And then the five times the x minus six would be five x minus 30. So that looks a little bit easier to solve. So now I'm gonna subtract four x and then add 30. So that cancels, that cancels, so I end up getting a negative 15 equals x. And then again, if you were to substitute it back in, negative 15, 4 fifths times negative 15 would be a negative 12. Is that negative 12? Let's see. Yeah, negative 12 minus 9 would be a negative 21. And if I put negative 15 in here, negative 15 minus six would also be negative 21. So you'd have the cube root of negative 21 on the left and the cube root of negative 21 on the right. So that does work. All right, and going back, this one worked. Um, all right, now we have um, function operations. So we have um, this notation, f, g of x, means that we're multiplying the f and g function together. And this f over g of x means that we are dividing the f and g function. We also have to state their domains. And I see that there's even roots here, so we're going to have to be careful. x has to be greater than or equal to 0 um, is probably going to be their um, domain for 1, except the second one, because I'm dividing and there will be an x in the denominator, um, the domain will have to be just greater than 0. So I can already tell you what the domain's going to be right now because beca uh, because they're even and be, um, the first one when you're multiplying will have a domain of x greater than or equal to zero. But the second one, because the, there's going to be an x in the denominator, it cannot equal zero. So it would just strictly be x greater than zero. All right, well, let me show you how to multiply and divide these things. So um, try the, hopefully you're trying these on your own first and then you're just checking these. But these are your f and g function. So if we, if we have f g of x, that means you're going to take your f of x function times your g of x function. Oops, helps if you can see that. Um, so our f of x function is x to the 3 fourths power. Our g of x function is negative 3 x to the 1 half power. Um, if you would like, put a coefficient here of 1 because when you're multiplying things, um, terms together, you multiply their coefficients, but you add the exponents of the variables that are the same. So the one times the negative three will be negative three, but your x, you're gonna have to add the exponents, the three fourths plus the one half. So if we get a common denominator, that one half would be two fourths, so negative three x to the power of three fourths plus two fourths, and then um, now that I got a common denominator, I can add my numerators and I get negative three x to the five fourths. But because this is a function, I should write f g of x equals negative three x to the five fourths power. And that would be how you'd write your answer. So make sure it's an equation, not just the negative three x to the five fourths power. You gotta say f g of x equals negative three x to the five fourths power. And the domain for this one, since it's an even root, so you look at the bottom, the root, um, when it's even, it has to be all x's that are greater than or equal to zero. So it cannot be a negative, you cannot have, um, x cannot be a negative number since your root is even. Okay, the next one, we are dividing f over g of x, which basically means f of x divided by g of x. So we have the same two functions, but we're gonna be dividing. So the f of x function goes at the top. Again, I'm gonna put a one in front for the coefficient, and then I'm dividing by the negative three x to the one half power on the bottom. 
So if I reduce my coefficients, 1 divided by negative 3 is just going to give me a negative 1 third. But my variable, the x, well, let me just separate this. So the x, I have to subtract. When you divide variables, you subtract their exponents. 3 fourths minus 1 half. And just like before in the last problem, the 1 half and the 3 fourths, we, get a, we need to get a common denominator, which would be 4. So I'll have 3 fourths minus 2 fourths. So 1 half is equal to 2 fourths. Then when I subtract, I would have x to the 1 fourth power. So your coefficient would be negative 1 third, and your x would be to the power of 1 fourth. So make sure this looks like an exponent and that the x does not look like it's in the denominator. It's to the right of that coefficient. And then on the left side, we're going to write what the name of the function is, f over g of x. And then as far as the domain, again, we have an even root. So we would typically say that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. However, since we started by putting a variable in the denominator, your uh, denominator cannot equal 0. Therefore, x cannot equal 0. So it's strictly x's that are greater than 0, not greater than or equal to. All right, so there is the page. Page 2 is done. Page 3. Page 3, is um, number 18, is the same type of problem as the last one, but the um, it's going to work out just a little bit differently, so it's good to get some extra practice um, so you know how different problems work out. But again, we're multiplying the f and g function, then we're dividing the f and g function. So if we take f of x times g of x, we're going to have negative 6x times 2 to the x. Uh, 2x to the 9 fifths power. Okay, so again, we would multiply our coefficients, get negative 12, but then we would add the exponents. Well, this one doesn't have a written exponent, so we, its unwritten exponent is 1. So if we're adding these exponents, we have to get a common denominator. So if you have fifths here, you want fifths here. Well, how many fifths can you get out of one whole? Five. So five fifths plus the 9 fifths will give me negative 12x to the 14 fifths power. And um, the 14 over 5 cannot reduce. We're just going to leave it that way. Um, but you should say that it equals fg of x. And then as far as the domain, um, look at your root. The root is 5, which is odd. Um, and we never had anything in the denominator. So with the odd root, your domain will be all real numbers, which is nice. Um, it's everybody's favorite answer. Okay, um, the next one we have f over g of x, which means we're going to divide the f of, x fun f of x function by the g of x function. So negative 6x, again, it's to the first power, if there's no exponent there, divided by 2x to the 9 fifths power. So we d divide the coefficients in front, which gives you negative 3, and then you're going to subtract your exponents. So again, that 1, I'm going to rewrite it as 5 fifths so that I get a common denominator, minus 9 fifths. So when I subtract the 5 fifths minus 9 fifths, I will have x to the power of negative 4 fifths. Well, you cannot leave your answer with a negative exponent, unfortunately. So if you do end up subtracting and getting a negative exponent, you need to move that x to the denominator. But the 3 is not a negative exponent. It's just a negative coefficient. So negative coefficients can stay where, they're up, where they are. It's just the x that has the negative exponent that he has to be moved to the denominator to make it positive 4 fifths. So f over g of x then is going to equal or simplify to negative 3 over x to the 4 fifths power. And then as far as your domain, because it's an odd root, we would normally say x can be anything or all real numbers. However, since we have an x in the denominator and our denominator cannot equal 0, your domain would be all real numbers except x cannot equal 0. So, or you can just say x cannot equal 0. Um, and there we have it for that one. So that's number 18. 
in number 19, we are adding and subtracting now instead of multiplying and dividing. But then there's also this extra part that they want us to evaluate the function for x equals negative 2. All right, so we're going like, to, so this is kind of like a two or three part, three or four part problem. So um, we're going to first add the two functions together, then we're going to subtract, and then we'll substitute negative 2 into each function. So the f plus g of x will equal the f of x function, which is x to the third minus 4x squared plus 7x plus the g of x function, 8 minus 3x plus x squared. Now notice that um, you've got an x to the third here, but you don't have any more x to the thirds. So your x to the third will be all by itself. It doesn't have any like terms. And you're adding, so you don't have to worry about changing any signs over here. Just combine like terms. So negative 4x squared, positive 1x squared will be negative 3x squared. 7, positive 7, and negative 3x will give you a positive 4x. And then you've got your positive 8. So that's your f plus g of x. So that is your answer for f plus g of x. Do not substitute negative 2 yet. Um, that is your answer. You don't want to substitute negative 2 before you add. So this is your f plus g of x function. Now if you're trying to find f plus g of negative 2, that's when you have to substitute. So this is going to be a two-part problem. Um, so when we substitute negative 2 now, negative 2 to the third power minus 3 times negative 2 squared plus 4 times negative 2 plus 8. And we simplify. Negative 2 to the third power is going to be a negative 8. We have to square here, so that's going to be 4 times a negative 3 will be negative 12. The negative 2 times 4 will be a negative 8. And then we have this plus 8 here. So the negative and positive 8 cancel each other out. Negative 8 and negative 12 is negative 20. So we end up getting f plus g of negative 2 equals negative 20. All right, so there is those first two answers. Probably should have given a little bit more room for this problem. Um, well, I might just have to go into this margin area over here. So the second part of this problem is to subtract f minus g of x. All right, so f minus g of x will equal the f of x function, which is x to the third minus 4x squared plus 7x minus the g of x function, which is 8 minus 3x plus x squared. So since you're subtracting, make sure you distribute and change all those signs to the right. So this polynomial, all the signs are going to change in each term. But these terms in the first polynomial, f of x, do not change. So that's going to become a negative 8, that's going to become a positive 3x, and then a negative x squared. Then we look for like terms. Again, we don't have any like term with the x to the third. I'm also going to bring down this so that I'm writing my whole equation. So the x to the third is the only term like that. The negative 4x squared and the negative 1x squared will be negative 5x squared. Positive 7x and positive 3x is a positive 10x, and then I have a minus 8 at the end. So that would be my answer for x minus g of x. Then if you're substituting the negative 2 into the equation, that's the next step, you would again take negative 2 to the third power minus 5 times negative 2 squared plus 10 times negative 2 minus 8. So I would substitute the negative 2 in for all of those x's and then simplify. So negative 2 to the third would be negative 8. Negative 2 squared is a positive 4 times negative 5 is a negative 20. 10 times negative 2 is another negative 20 and then I have this minus 8. So none of these numbers are going to cancel out. So let's see, negative 40 and negative 16 is negative 56. So f minus g of negative 2 equals negative 56 is how I would write my answer. And I went into the next problem a little bit. Okay, moving on now to 
the graphs. So we're supposed to graph the parent and the new function. Um, so I will use red for my parent function. So if you look at your original equation, if we take away the a and the k, we're just ha we just have x to the one half power. So your equation, your parent, do that off the left, the parent would just be y equals x to the one half power, which is the same as the square root of x. So if you're more comfortable rewriting it as a square root of x, then go ahead. And the square root of x function, parent function, we cannot, put, uh, we cannot put negative numbers in because we have an even root. So we're gonna start with zero, then one, and four is what I suggest. And then when we take the square root of each of these, we get zero, one, and two. And then when we graph it, we get zero, zero, one, one, four, two. So that is the graph of the parent. All right, so we're graph the function and its parent. So we graph the parent. Now let's graph this function. So when I look at this, I see that my a value is negative 2, which is going to affect my y coordinates. So I would multiply my y coordinates by negative 2, and that's going to make it reflect over the x-axis along with stretching it by a vertical factor, or vertically stretching it by a factor of 2. And then this plus 5 at the end is a k value, which will also affect the y coordinates. So after I multiply them by negative 2, I'm going to add 5 to make them go up. But nothing is with the x inside the parentheses or inside the radical, so the x will not be changing. So um, now my table, I'm going to rewrite my table as x and g of x. My x values stay the same, but when I multiply by negative 2 and add 5, Um, I will get 0 plus 5, which is 5, negative 2 plus 5, which is 3, and negative 4 plus 5, which will be 1. Remember, this is a starting point. Just like the 0, 0 is a starting point, it does not go left and right. It, has, it starts at 0, 0 and goes off to the right. Well, this graph is going to start at 0, 5, and then it's going to go to 1, 3, which is right here, and then 4, 1, which is right there. So it's going to start here. It's not going to go to the left. It's going to start at 0, 5 and go down to the right. And that is G. So make sure you label it. Now, as far as finding the domain and range, you're looking at the G function, not the parent. So if you look again at your starting point, which is 0, 5, the lowest x value is 0, and then it goes off to the right. So your domain will be the x's that are greater than or equal to 0. And your y is 5, so that's the highest point, and then it's going down. So your y is going to be less than or equal to 5. So be careful with that less than if it's go opening down. If it's opening up, it's going to be greater than. But if it's opening down, it's less than. All right, as, as far as describing the transformations, I kind of did it verbally a minute ago. But um, the negative in front tells us that it's going to reflect over or in the x-axis. You can't just say, you cannot just say that it's just a reflection. Um, you have to state what it's reflecting over. So it's reflecting over the x-axis. Um, so that's one. And then the second thing that's happening, that, that two is a vertical stretch by a factor of two. And then the last thing that's happening is that k value um, is positive 5, which means it's a vertical translation up 5. All right, so there's our transformations, our domain, our range, and both of our graphs. I think that we did it all. Moving on to the next problem. So this one is a cubed root rather than a square root. I'll use purple. So my parent for the cubed root is just y equals the cubed root of x. And because it's an odd root, you can use negative numbers. So I'm going to use negative 1, 0, and positive 1. And when I take the cubed root of each of those, I do get negative 1, 0, and positive 1. So 
it looks like it might be a straight line, but it's not. It's going to have that little S curve in it that kind of goes to the right and then to the left. So that's your parent, and these are the three points that we started with. All right, so what are we doing with this parent function? Well, we've got um, this plus 4 underneath. So since it's inside the radical, it's going to affect the x coordinates. So that's an h value, and the x plus 4 underneath the radical means that h is negative 4, and it's going to be a horizontal translation to the left 4. So I can put that down here right now, the first transformation. Horizontal translation left 4. And again, that's because your h is actually negative. Your k equals negative 3, which means you have a vertical translation down 3. And that's it. There's no uh, stretches or compressions. So for this one, I don't think we necessarily need to do a table. We just simply have to go to the left 4 and down 3. So if I take this point here and move to the left 4, make sure you count carefully, and then down 3, that puts me here. And then if I take that center point that was at 0, 0, move to the left 4, and down 3, that gives me the point negative 4, negative 3. So the H and K do give you that center point. And then the last one, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, down 1, 2, 3. It's going to have the same shape, but it's just simply moved over. And we're going to label that H since they called this graph H. Now with cubed roots and with other odd roots, what's nice is um, they do keep going left and right forever and ever, and even though it's slowly going up and slowly going down, it does keep going up and down forever and ever also. So both domain and range for the odd roots are going to be all real numbers. All right, so there's the um, answer for number 21. Going on to page 4. Okay, so um, now we have a one-half on the inside with the x, and it's to the one-third power. So if you are uncomfortable with the rational exponents, you can always rewrite it as a cubed root of one-half x. So the root is 3, so we can rewrite that as a cubed root. Um, wait, it's not a one-third here, though. It's a one-half. Okay, and since this is on the inside and being multiplied, this is a horizontal, and then when you think of that b value, um, it being one half, it's the reciprocal, so um, it actually is going to make it stretch. So when you look at that value that's on the inside, you have to think, flip it, or what's the inverse of it? Well, the inverse of it is two, which means it's going to be a horizontal stretch by a factor of two. So that's going to affect the x-coordinates. Um, so when you um, graph this, again, you have to graph the parent. So the parent, we had just graphed it a second ago. So whether you call it um, x to the one-third power or you call it the cubed root of x, they're the same thing. Because it's an odd root, you may put in negative numbers. And we get negative 1, 0, 1. And we have that S curve in the middle. And then it goes right and left, so that's your parent function. And if we're stretching it horizontally by a factor of 2, the points here and here, instead of one space away, will be two spaces away from the y-axis. So um, you could just simply, shi or not shift, but stretch it. Again, horizontal stretches are away from the y-axis. So instead of one space away, we would now be two spaces away. If you're stretching a point that's on the y-axis, it can't move either way. And then this point is one space away, so we now stretch it to two spaces away. So that this is your um, f function, they call it. And the, the blue one was the parent. So they're almost right on top of each other, but just slightly different. Now, if you... Um, are unsure of how to do that with um, just graphing it, then um, you can 
multiply your in order to stretch your um, points horizontally by a factor of two you would multiply the x coordinates by two so you could um, just multiply the x coordinates by two and make your new points the y coordinates are not changing because we don't have anything in front being multiplied or anything at the end being added or subtracted just multiplying the x coordinates by 2 which will give you negative 2 0 and positive 2 so when you graph the point negative 2 negative 1 that puts you here 0 0 is still there and then 2 1 is still here alright as far as domain again it's a cubed root so it's going to keep going right and left forever and ever and up and down forever and ever so odd roots all real numbers and then oh I guess I already wrote the transformation up here but if it were write it down here horizontal stretch by a factor of two all right the next one we have both a negative and a two on the inside and if you look at your root it's a square root it's not a cubed root so our parent is going to be y equals the square root of x and when you have an even root you cannot use negative numbers for x so 0 1 and 4 are the numbers that we use when we take the square root of those we get 0 1 and 2 so our parent is 0 0 1 1 4 2 and we have a starting point and it goes up and to the right it does not go down or d does not go in both directions all right so the negative what does the negative on the inside do to the graph that is going to reflect so your um, if b equals negative 2 then the reciprocal of that um, so 1 over b is actually going to be 1 over negative 2 but the negative is going to reflect it over the y-axis so when the negative is on the inside you reflect it over the y-axis so it reflects over or in or across the y-axis so make sure it's y-axis because it's on the inside and then um, because this is 2 when you take the reciprocal of it it's actually a, a horizontal shrink or a horizontal compression by a factor of one half so and a horizontal shrink or compression by a factor of one half and a factor is something that's multiplied so you cannot say factor when you have translations up or down or left or right factor is only what we use the word with uh, shrinks or stretches or compressions all right so um, when you multiply the x values if you're going to do the table you would multiply them by this reciprocal so the reciprocal of negative 2 is negative 1 half so we would multiply our x values by negative 1 half to graph them but nothing is happening to the y coordinates and I'm going to also name this g of x so we separate the two tables and which one represents which um, so negative 1 half times 0 is still 0 negative 1 half times 1 is negative 1 half negative 1 half times 2 4 is negative 2 and my y coordinates will still stay the same so now when you graph these points 0 0 is your starting point again but negative 1 half means you're gonna go to the left and then positive 1 means you're gonna go up 1 so to the left 1 half and up 1 and then the third point to the left 2 and up 2 so this is what your graph of G is going to look like and this one over here is the parent so because it reflected over 